revealing the inside workings of power in various situations as an independence campaigner for Scotland and as somebody who has always spoken up for the public in the public interest. Our next speaker is author, blogger, journalist, Kramer. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to be here again and to uh, see so many people I know here again and also happily to see some people I don't know. Uh, it's uh, great to have some new faces along. Um, I should start by saying I think I'm the only person in the United Kingdom who officially is not a journalist, uh, according <laughs> to a decision by the High Court of Scotland. Um, which, is, <laughs> which is extraordinary as well, because I'm also the only person in the United Kingdom who is officially according to the High Court of England, not an anti-Semite, after another court case I was involved in. So, um, uh, how I get myself um, into these uh, legal cases, which are always the law having a go at me, and, and me defending myself rather than me initiating anything, I, I, I'm really not quite sure why I'm seen as such a debt to the state, and all I do is publish um, on a blog, which they feel has to be delegitimized, um, uh, harassed by continual attack and, uh, and de-prioritized by suppression of uh, social media. Um, it's, it's extraordinary that, that somebody like me, uh, who has really done nothing except write true accounts, for example, of what happens at Julian Assange's trial, write, write the detail of what happens in the courtroom itself, um, all I've ever tried to do is publish aspects of the truth, not, not <laughs> in the spectacular mass fashion that, that WikiLeaks managed it, but uh, plodding away an insane cause. Uh, yet that nowadays is deemed uh, such a debt uh, to the state that they have to suppress you and even imprison you. And I, I think that says something deeply, deeply worrying. And I, I think we ought to think, here am I telling you I am officially uh, not a journalist. Uh, and let's look at what the people are doing who officially are journalists. Uh, how many people have seen the Daily Telegraph today? That is the front page of the Daily Telegraph. Um, I'll, I'll send this into the audience so you can pass it round in, in a moment. Dominated by a huge photo of two men in Ghislaine Maxwell's bath. Uh, and the headline is, the photo that clears Duke over bath sex. And the purpose of the photograph is to convince everybody uh, that Prince Andrew could not have molested a sex trafficked minor in that bath because the bath is too small. And not only does that tell us something uh, very interesting about the sex lives of Daily Telegraph journalists, it's an astonishing exercise in poor taste. But you've got a convicted sex trafficker in the United States, and the photo the article tells us is posed by two of her friends with the object of attempting to show uh, that a member of the royal family uh, could not have taken part in the sex trafficking which he paid over $12 million to get out of. Who, who finds that at all reasonable? And who finds it reasonable that one of the adults poses in the bath, presumably as a joke, because there can be no other reason for it, with a mask with the face of the sex trafficked young woman on it. That's just disgusting. And that is one of the United Kingdom's oldest and most respected broadsheets and the newspaper which is the closest to our current government at Westminster. That's what the establishment <coughs> think journalism is. 
That is disgusting. That is immoral. You don't go to prison for that. You go to prison for publishing the truth about war crimes. We live in a society where respect for true journalism is non-existent and the real journalists are punished and the most disgusting sycophants and smears are those who get on in the journalistic profession. If someone could grab this, if you could pass it around the audience just so people could uh, look and see what I was talking about while I, uh, while I continue. Um, it's wonderful to see the artwork from Guantanamo here today, the copies of it, and um, I very much hope that we do manage to raise the funds to get the original artwork over here, because you know, artwork from Guantanamo is a real triumph of the, of the human spirit over terrible oppression, and reminds us of the evil uh, that we are fighting against, the evil that collected people in Afghanistan and shipped them off to Guantanamo deliberately by design to put them beyond law so they could be systematically tortured. Think of that. The whole purpose was to put people where they might be tortured. And the dreadful tortures people suffered uh, in Guantanamo have been, I, I've heard, I've sat beside people while they uh, enumerate the tortures they were subjected to. And it reminds us of what WikiLeaks helped reveal and the kind of behavior the state is attempting to cover up and make sure it can do in secret in future by its persecution of Julia. It also reminds me of the war on terror period and the collusion of the media in the terrible waves of Islamophobia, in the oppression of entirely innocent Muslim people in this country and elsewhere, in the attacks on civil liberties that were carried out under that excuse. But I remember the front page stories on things like the Dyson plot and on the Easter bombing in Manchester um, where seven people were arrested and it was the headline TV news on every channel uh, and it was the front page in every newspaper that the police had foiled a bomb plot at Easter in Manchester by descending on this house and that they had removed materials including materials that could be moved in bomb making uh, and several months later um, when the poor people who had been imprisoned throughout that period were eventually released without charge. Uh, it turned out that the materials that could be used in bomb making was a bag of granulated sugar in the kitchen. Uh, none of which, the, the, the arrests having been all over the front pages, the release, I think, got... Um, one very small paragraph on page seven of The Guardian, and that was about it. The fact it was all simply untrue um, uh, was never published. And that was a deliberate ramping up of fear and a stoking of Islamophobia by the security services amplified by the media. And we've seen extraordinary further lies by the media, the famous uh, story of Manafort calling on Assange uh, in the embassy, uh, which was utterly untrue, simply never ever happened, and for which, with no shame at all, uh, the Guardian refuses still to this day uh, to recant, despite it obviously being false. Now, I add into that, and that maybe um, Jonathan brilliantly. Uh, outlined the reasons we have this media and the use of the media for exerting social control. And I add into that the corruption of the legal system that we have seen in Julian's case. And corruption is the only possible word. But I was first alerted to it um, before 
the American extradition case when the Swedish extradition process was still in train. Um, by, of course, the extraordinary gap between uh, what was happening and the lack of any actual serious evidence from the investigation, but also when there was a judgment by uh, the House of Lords, by Lord Phillips, uh, who was the lead judge, uh, in that extradition case, where the decision that Julian could be held for extradition um, turned on the question of what was a judicial authority, because an extradition request had to come from a judicial authority. And in the Swedish case, it didn't. It didn't come from a court or a judge. It merely came from a prosecutor, a politically motivated prosecutor, after other prosecutors had dropped the case. And a prosecutor is plainly not a judicial authority. Um, and uh, this went all the way to the House of Lords. And in the House of Lords, they ruled, and this is absolutely true, I'm not making this up, but while a prosecutor is not a judicial authority in English, the extradition uh, arrangement, the European extradition arrangement, uh, was in French and English, and both languages were equally valid. And if you looked at the French <laughs> version of the treaty, it said autorité judiciaire. And while judicial authority in English does not encompass prosecution and uh, prosecutors, in French, judicial authority does encompass prosecutors. This is absolutely astonishing. I, mean, I was a, a, a diplomat man for more than two decades. I was involved in negotiating and drafting treaties. Um, it has never, ever been the case that in signing a treaty, the United Kingdom government has preferred the French language version to the English language version before. Uh, that, 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 that is a simple impossibility. And the idea that when they signed the treaty, the UK authorities were, were, were signing it in French, not in English, uh, is, is, is plainly a, an utter nonsense. Plus, it's simply untrue. The phrases in English and French mean exactly the same thing. It doesn't mean something different in French. This incredible bit of judicial sophistry, this, this simple lie, and this extraordinary precedent setting that in future we're going to prefer the foreign language version of treaties. All of that was done as a ruse to keep Julian in custody. And all of it was complete and utter obvious bollocks to anybody who was closely following what was going on. And that was when I first realized, and that was about 2011, 2012, that was when I first realized something is very, very wrong here. Then, of course, I started uh, attending uh, the, the hearings uh, after uh, the United States extradition proceedings came in, and they were even more astonishing. You know, the, the ruling that you can be extradited under an extradition treaty, but that uh, Article 2.4 of that extradition treaty that forbids political extradition does not have effect because the treaty does not have effect in English law, but still you're being extradited under it, um, well, was a piece of judicial gymnastics that was almost impossible to understand. The fact that the uh, prosecution, uh, the United States government, had all Julian's legal papers after having them stolen from the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, that, that was absolutely astonishing. It went on and on as an absolute circus. And we are at a stage where something needs to change. We need a massive uprising in public opinion because we have a controlled media, we have a controlled judiciary, we have increasing restrictions on freedom of speech where it's almost impossible to find any platform, not even a meeting hall, in which you can voice opposition to the war in Ukraine, for example. We are living in a society which has crept further and further towards fascism 
and is continuing to do so. And it gets worse year after year after year to the point when we really are almost there. Getting Julian out of jail has to be the start of a fundamental change in society and the way society is heading. But until we manage to wake up more of society and to wake up the so-called liberal left into what they are going along with and what they are allowing to happen in our country, that won't happen. It's been a hard campaign. I'm actually more optimistic for Julian than I have been for a long, long time. There have been many signs of particularly senior politicians, his own government in Australia, and of the media finally waking up and smelling the coffee and realise what's going on. I think we are making progress. We're getting far better hearing in public and far better public reception. And I'm sure you'll find that too when campaigning than we did four or five years ago. I do believe that things are going our way. We have to redouble the fight to make them continue to go our way. Thank you very much. Thank you.